Hello everyone. So friends, colleagues, students and visitors, welcome to the Melbourne School of Design Dean's Lecture Series. My name is Julie Willis and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Architecture Building and Planning here at the University of Melbourne. I begin this evening's proceedings by acknowledging the traditional owner of the lands on which this event is taking place, which may be multiple lands given the location of all of you. I'm currently speaking from Wurundjeri land and I pay my respects to their elders past and present, acknowledge any Indigenous persons joining us today, and I acknowledge the place of Indigenous knowledge in the Academy. The Dean's Lecture Series aims to connect the Melbourne community with international leaders in built environment fields. Tonight, I'm very pleased to kick off the series for 2022 with special guest Jennifer Gabris. Jennifer is Chair in Media, Culture and Environment in the Department of Sociology at the University of Cambridge. She's involved in numerous research projects with much of her work investigating concerns and innovations relating to the environment and climate change at the intersection of arts and sciences. Jennifer leads the Planetary Praxis Research Group and is the principal investigator on the European Research Council funded project, Smart Forests, transforming environments into social political technologies. She also leads Citizen Sense and Air Kit, which are participatory and practice-based research projects funded by the ERC that address air pollution and citizen engagement. Jennifer writes on digital technologies, environments and social life with recent publications, including How to Do Things with Sensors and Program Earth, Environmental Sensing Technology and the Making of a Computational Planet. In this evening's presentation, Jennifer will explore how atmospheric citizens are constituted through practices of sensing environments and working to build more breathable worlds. For those of you in Melbourne, Jennifer has an exhibition currently running as part of her involvement in the Dean's Lecture Series. The exhibition is titled Highly Sensitive and explores many of the themes she will discuss this evening, focusing on the, the role of environmental sensors and the multitude of information that they can provide about the world around us, from temperature and air quality measurements to feedback from noise and touch. For the built environment prof professions, these form, forms of data represent a crucial step in how we think about our environment and what we create within them. If you're lo locally based, I do encourage you to come down to the faculty to see her exhibition in person in the Brian Lewis Atrium. Details are on our MSD website and the exhibition runs until the 9th of May. I'm very much looking forward to her presentation and I'm very pleased to now hand over to Jennifer. Welcome and thank you for joining us here this evening. Thank you so much uh, to Dean Julie Willis for that really generous introduction. Um, also to Wendy Walls and everyone involved with organizing this three-day event that really has a, a quite epic and in-depth look at sensors. Um, I'm very pleased to have a small part also in the highly sensitive exhibition, which has many very interesting uh, engagements with sensors across heat, noise, uh, thermal cameras, and much more. So yes, I would just reiterate that uh, emphasis to, to go to the exhibition in person if you can. I've spent many years working on sensors and researching and testing these through practice-based inquiry. So tonight I'm going to present some of this work um, that I've undertaken through Citizen Sense and a new book that I have uh, coming out. It's, it's sort of already out online in a um, online format, but it will be out in print version this fall called Citizens of Worlds. So the talk I'll be giving today is based on the introductory material from Citizens of Worlds. And um, the majority of the material will really be about three case studies we did as part of the Citizen Sense project. So uh, there will be a kind of initial framing and then I'll get into the, the substance of this practice-based research um, that will really show how we worked with communities to test sensors and see how they work when they're um, really installed in the fields. From drone monitoring of pipeline construction at Standing Rock in the Dakota Nation to water testing in Flint, Michigan, radiation testing in Fukushima, Japan, deforestation monitoring in Romania, and air pollution monitoring in London, a diverse set of DIY, grassroots, and citizen-led practices 
is materializing to monitor environments. These sensing practices document pollution of air, soil, water, and ecosystems, and they often challenge the destruction of environments. Whether monitoring public infrastructure and utilities, contesting extractive industries, or documenting environmental pollutants and biodiversity lost, such practices seek to generate alternative forms of evidence in place of government or industry data. At the same time, these practices express different worlds of experience, along with multiple political subjects and relations that constitute them. Citizen-led digital monitoring now extends to a vast array of different environmental concerns. So today I'll draw on um, this work from Citizens of Worlds and discuss how in the Citizen Sense project, we focused on citizens using sensors specifically to gauge air pollution. Of course, we took a, a broader scan in looking at many types of environmental sensors, but we focused on air pollution uh, sensors for this research funded by the ERC. And uh, in fact, this is the, the first uh, time that I've circulated the image of the cover, which you can see here, but the um, manifold edition, which is online, is the preprint version you can find on the University of Minnesota Press website if you're interested to have a, a sort of preview of the material, um, which is there. So here's the introduction, which I'll be speaking um, from tonight. From environmental justice groups monitoring petrochemicals in the Imperial Valley of California to urban residents tracking exposure to air pollution in India and China, there's been a proliferation of citizen sensing projects focused on air quality. As one of the deadliest forms of environmental pollution, air pollution is a problem primarily caused by fossil fuel extraction and use, including through transport, construction, buildings, and industry. Air pollution also now occurs at significant levels due to the atmospheric accumulation of fossil fuels that lead to climate change, which further contribute to wildfires, particle formation, haze, and smog. The World Health Organization has deemed air pollution, quote, the largest environmental risk factor on the planet. And they note that uh, as many as, an uh, in, in additional further research, as many as 8.8 .8 million people worldwide die each year from the effects of indoor and outdoor air pollution, with 4.2 million of these deaths attributable to outdoor air pollution. So citizen uh, sensing is a practice formed through struggles to contend with these changing and polluted environments. And I'm uh, considering environmental monitoring technologies as they've been taken up to attempt to document these environmental problems, and in some cases to upend existing forms of expertise. These engagements remake the usual approaches to environmental action and demand that other experiences and worlds be taken into account. However, as I will also discuss here, these technologies could be analyzed as part of a neoliberal sales pitch, where digital technologies are packaged in a, in a glossy veneer of democratic action that does little to shift the entrenched conditions of environmental pollution or social injustice. While citizen-oriented technologies might promise a straightforward realization of positive political change, they might not yield such uh, effortless outcomes when put into practice. So this is exactly what we tested, was whether and how these technologies might allow people to realize different forms of environmental citizenship and what this looked like on the ground when these digital devices were put um, into use uh, and uh, people tried to document their concerns about environmental pollution and injustice. So ac to account for these variable sensing practices, I'm here engaging with citizens, neither as universal human actors nor as icons of technological liberation. Instead, I suggest that the citizens and citizen sensing are politically activated entities that form through worlds of struggle. People monitor environments to address and reduce pollution and related concerns. In this way, we could say that sensing citizens become citizens of worlds. So with this concept, I'm offering an approach to citizens where different ways of sensing and being affected by environments can activate, reinforce, or transform political subjects and collectives. Citizens require distinct worlds to come into being and to express political affiliations. 
Worlds are not containers or discrete spheres, but rather are constitutive conditions of exchange. Worlds also form as conditions of proliferating citizenships and struggle, so citizenships can be multiple. Yet these collective conditions are not only a matter of human affairs, but also involve relations that take hold across more than humans, technologies, and milieus. To be citizens in the making requires worlds in the making. So the mutual constitution of citizens and worlds unfolds with and through exchanges that I describe as the breathability of worlds. Breathability indicates not just the ongoing access to actual air to breathe, but also how and whether environments, subjects, and relations can be in constructive exchange. Such exchanges involve reciprocity and mutual benefit as part of forming political subjects and worlds. Breathability articulates possibilities for participatory democratic interaction. Conditions of breathability align with political potential. Rather than indicating an essential biological state, breathability signals situations of differential confinement or flourishing, restriction or expansion that occur in exchange with other entities and milieus. To be and become citizens of worlds signals the ability to be in constructive exchange with milieus, to observe and contribute, to listen and be heard. Such exchanges allow for the realization of political and environmental relations that extend into the open air of lived experience rather than close in on the airless confines of the universal citizen. So I'm here uh, proposing in this first introductory um, glossing of the citizen, the atmospheric citizen, as a figure who monitors air pollution as part of a practice of building more breathable worlds. Yet throughout the extended text um, and in some of the case studies I'll show, there's multiple other modalities of citizens and citizenship that I investigate, from instrumental citizens to speculative citizens, data citizens, multiple citizens, sensing citizens, and more. So in the process of sketching out these uh, intersecting citizenships and citizens of worlds, I consider how different practices generate different figures of breathability and struggle. So by investigating the problem of the citizen and citizen sensing, what we've undertaken in the citizen sense project, and you can see the website here, is exactly this kind of investigation across environments, subjects, technologies, and practices to understand how monitoring um, projects might take place in diverse locations. And Citizen Sense, uh, initially funded by the ERC, is a project I've led since 2013. And this research collective has worked with communities to monitor environmental problems with an emphasis on air pollution. And the, the remaining part of the talk that will show the case studies now documents and analyzes work that has involved developing and testing citizen sensing technologies installing sensing kits in collaboration with communities and analyzing citizen data to generate uh, evidence for action. So the case studies have been situated across the gas fields of Northeastern Pennsylvania in the US, the congested streets of Southeast London in the UK, and um, also the construction of air pollution gardens in the financial center of London, also in the UK. And through describing this practice-based research, I consider how these environmental sensing technologies and toolkits kits take shape in polluted conditions um, through struggles for uh, fighting for more just environments. So a key kind of component of how this is organized by exploring this practice-based research is through the figure of the, of the how-to. So how are sensors put to work? Um, how do they uh, take hold and how do they potentially fail? Um, how do they generate different uh, forms of implementation than the initial scripts might promise? And we initially sought to work with off-the-shelf technologies, and we do have some off-the-shelf technologies as part of this research, but we did end up building um, some devices ourselves as well. So I'll talk about this um, expanded set of practices in, in how we worked with sensors and tested air quality sensors in attempts to build more breathable worlds. So to turn now to the first case study, Speculative Citizens, How to Evidence Harm. In the endless mountains of Northeastern Pennsylvania, 
Residents and community groups are monitoring the growth and impacts of a relatively new industry, hydraulic fracturing, also known as unconventional shale gas extraction or simply fracking. This industry increasingly crisscrosses and carves up Pennsylvania landscapes, as well as many other sites around the world from Oklahoma to Siberia. Fracking involves extracting natural gas through first drilling vertically thousands of feet underground, then drilling laterally up to a mile and a half beneath shale rock formations, and finally injecting vast amounts of water, sand, and chemicals to fracture shale deposits and release bubbles of gas trapped in the porous rock. The extensive infrastructures of fracking span well development and drilling, well completion and production, on-site and off-site processing, distribution of, and storage of gas. At every point in this infrastructure, pollution potentially occurs to air, water, and soil. Yet in rural environments where most fracking occurs, there is a relative absence of air quality monitoring networks because air pollution is generally seen to be a problem of urban environments and higher population densities. Residents are then taking up assorted instruments to monitor and document fracking related pollutants in the air, water, and soil. People use a battery of equipment from badges to sensors and video to track and detect pollution. Some of these devices are analog and low tech, while others are digital and more complex to operate. Residents also share their techniques and findings with other community groups, state and federal regulators, and environmental and health NGOs. By using monitoring devices, residents seek to evidence harm. They express care for environments and health by documenting pollutants in situ and attempting to link these ill effects to health and environments. One such digital technique involves using forward-looking infrared video or FLIR documentation. When the FLIR camera operates in non-infrared mode, emissions from gas infrastructure are not visible. However, when full operation, the FLIR thermographic camera exposes significant drifts of methane, VOCs, benzene, and other gases that are often leaking from gas infrastructure. The citizen videos record emissions as they surge and leak from vents and release valves, altering atmospheres, affecting bodies, and transforming environments. In the fall of 2013, the Citizen Sense project began researching citizen-led monitoring of air pollution on the Marcella Shale in northeastern Pennsylvania, where there has been a high concentration of active drill sites. As part of the collaborative aspect of this research, we established a dialogue with residents about which pollutants and environmental disturbances they were already in the process of monitoring. We started how and why they undertook environmental monitoring, what wider networks were important for communicating their findings, and how it might be possible to work together to develop a citizen sensing toolkit that would be useful for monitoring air pollution from the fracking industry. Through a back and forth exchange that involved several institute in meetings and remote teleconferences, we developed a logbook of monitoring practices for people to document their existing monitoring, to also note their particular observations and concerns about how fracking was changing landscapes and indicate who should be monitoring and what should be monitored. We collected nearly 30 of these completed logbooks from residents, which included text, image, and video submissions. Based on the logbook images and videos submitted by residents documenting their environments, and here you can see some of the images that they submitted of existing monitoring and existing um, pollution, we then uh, worked together to um, identify possible monitoring technologies and practices that we assembled into a citizen sense toolkit for use and testing. And so you can see the components of that toolkit here. We designed this toolkit through ongoing discussions with residents and participants about the primary pollutants of concern and also what might be most adaptable and affordable and accessible over longer periods of use. So some of these components were off the shelf sensors and uh, including the spec particulate matter sensor, which you can see in the, in the center, the small black uh, curved um, device. Um, there were also analog badges we used, which you can see um, at the upper uh, left, right, um, I'm not quite sure, uh, with the uh, envelope uh, that monitor BTEX compounds, benzene, toluene, ethylbenzene, and xylene, which are pollutants especially associated with uh, petrochemical industry. 
We also custom built a frack box, which you can see um, in the, the mailbox, which uh, we placed next to compressor stations. And this monitored nitrogen oxides, ozone, uh, volatile organic compounds, temperature, humidity, and wind speed. So the Citizen Sense Toolkit was an assemblage of newly developed instruments as well as existing sensors. We borrowed the SPEC monitor from the CREATE lab at Carnegie Mellon University in Pennsylvania, which was making its device widely available for environmental and health groups to use throughout the state. And they were distributing these devices through public libraries. Um, in addition to these different air quality sensors, the toolkit included a custom online platform, uh, which you can see uh, here, where we um, allowed uh, a kind of private way of accessing data. So this wasn't open to general publics because people felt that their monitoring activities could uncover sensitive or controversial findings. So we set this up as a private site that was only accessible to participants during the monitoring period to ensure that monitoring locations were not disclosed. And just to sort of, um, as a footnote, this was a, a highly sort of fractured community uh, in addition to being uh, geologically fracked. Uh, there was quite a lot of conflict in the community. So people wanted to be quite careful about how the findings were released and disclosed. And we also then had a second logbook of how to uh, instructions for how to use various components of the, of the toolkit and to also record observations so that we weren't only collecting the numerical sensor data. So the Citizen Sense Toolkit was assembled through a process of collectively asking how to, how to monitor pollutants, how to develop or source sensors, how to site monitoring equipment, and how to record data. The how-to aspects of developing an environmental sensing toolkit form through practices of making and testing, while also drawing on earlier citizen monitoring studies and experiences. We then developed a second data platform, the ERSIS Data Analysis Toolkit, which brought the citizen data findings uh, into the public realm. And with plots and graphs we were able to generate using the ERSIS Toolkit, we worked with participants to collect further on the ground observations and experiences that we put together into narratives at five key locations in the network that we formed into data stories, which you can see here. The data stories analyze the citizen data and observations of pollution events, while also providing indications for how to mitigate or reduce pollution based on these findings. And we launched the, the Pennsylvania data stories in April 2016. So this was almost a three year long um, process. I'm skipping over quite a lot of material. And if, if you'd like to read more, you can certainly go on the Citizen Sense website and Manifold site. But we released the findings in 2016 and shared these also with state and federal regulators. And one federal agency followed up by also undertaking a test monitoring at one site to corroborate citizen findings. And they also found similar levels of elevated pollution um, and patterns that indicated that there were likely pollution sources stemming from fracking infrastructure. So this very much corroborated the citizen findings and the federal agency um, recommended that the Pennsylvania State Department of Environmental Protection should develop more robust practices for monitoring and mitigating emissions, particularly from industry. So this, this evidence came together in the data stories and the parallel federal monitoring, which supported what the citizens were finding. So the state level DEP then uh, had a press release that mentioned they were going to undertake an unprecedented expansion of their particulate matter air monitoring network throughout the state, including in rural locations, to um, document particulate matter at sites of concern. And there is now uh, a monitor that monitors not only PM, but uh, many VOCs and other pollutants in the area that we were monitoring. So the Participants and the community groups really saw this as a sort of successful outcome from their research. Of course, industry was disappointed by this and said that they thought this was based on speculative data. But a participant, well, one participant in particular, said that it was actually quite useful to take this more speculative approach, since it was better to undertake monitoring and to have uh, a kind of 
anticipatory understanding of pollution and what harm might be done rather than undertake retrospective public health studies. So the process of evidencing harm drew on these multiple forms of sensor data, citizen data and evidence, which could be used in these speculative ways, generating atmospheric and speculative citizenships for proposing political subjects and struggles toward more breathable worlds. Rather than document pollution once it has affected environments and health, this sought to speculate about pollution as it was occurring and might become even worse and propose mitigating action. So to move on then to the second project area case study, data citizens, how to reinvent rights. Following the research focused on fracking and pollution, the second phase of citizen sense research studied citizen sensing of air pollution in urban environments. During nearly, nearly two years from spring 2016 to late autumn 2017, we collaborated with residents of the neighboring wards of Deptford and New Cross in Southeast London to monitor air quality in relation to traffic, development and industrial emissions. These neighborhoods are sites of former industry, dockyards and the historic naval shipyard, as well as community markets, housing estates and an incinerator. An area that has been marked by economic deprivation and, and inequality, unemployment and limited job opportunities, Defford and New Cross also have larger black and minority ethnic populations than many other parts of London. The area has been the location for ongoing struggles over environmental justice, injustice. These practices came together to support cases for improving the urban realm, which were made through uh, local meetings. Um, so citizen monitoring practices that are already underway um, where people were um, putting forward uh, proposals for how to address planning applications and developing um, campaigns. So one citizen monitoring project, which you can see here, don't dump on Deptford's heart, Residents installed diffusion tubes, which are analog uh, devices for monitoring nitrogen dioxide, in order to contest the proposed development of a national infrastructure project, the Thames Tideway Super Sewer, which was being constructed or proposed at that time to be constructed to update the decaying London sewage infrastructure that contributes frequent wastewater discharges to the River Thames. And with this air quality data that they uh, collected using analog monitoring devices, the community group was able to document the poor state of air quality throughout the proposed development area. And you can see the, the highest pollution here in the black circles with the higher numbers, um, still quite high pollution in red and the lowest pollution uh, in green. So here, uh, the super sewer was meant to mitigate the problem of air pollution, but residents feared it would exacerbate the problem of air pollution, especially through producing emissions from the construction of the super sewer and during operation of the pumping stations and ventilation shafts. And despite their efforts to monitor air pollution, the infrastructure project was approved and began uh, construction. So this is an example of how we again, first came to understand existing monitoring practices in the area and then developed conversations and dialogue with people to develop an additional sensor kit. And there were many other existing monitoring practices underway, um, which I won't have time to um, discuss, but uh, through this, we then uh, decided to develop a particulate matter sensor that would be specific to the area um, rather than work with the off the shelf uh, spec monitor um, that we had uh, with the fracking um, uh, installation. So in this case, we developed the dust box toolkit and the form of the dust box is based on uh, contaminated uh, soil particles and pollen when magnified under an electron microscope. So we'd spent a fair amount of time looking at atmospheric uh, chemistry and science research to understand air pollution and uh, we're quite fascinated by the variable composition of particulate matter, which can have many different types of particles. And we use this as inspiration um, for then developing uh, housing for a sensor. And we worked with a 3D printing process here um, using a cast form. Th these were initially, the first DustBox 1.0 is um, in ceramic. And these are small plug and play monitors that use a widely available Xinyi 
particle sensor unit, which is installed in numerous low cost and DIY monitors, um, especially at the time. This uh, monitor also had a custom printed circuit board, an electric imp Wi-Fi module, and a fan for circulating air. So it's quite a simple device on the inside. And if you're interested to learn more about that, you can go on our website and see um, how that's actually composed. But we developed the Dustbox, at, Dustbox as an effective and tactile device that would resonate with the often gritty environmental conditions of this area in Southeast London, while also circulating as an engaging uh, sort of component of a citizen sensing infrastructure. Along with investigating the citizenships that might be activated or mobilized through setting up a network of dust box, part dust box particle sensors, we were interested to understand how this sensor could operate in an urban setting where there was a well-known problem with air quality, but not necessarily a single emission source that could be readily identified. And there also weren't very many um, regulatory monitors in this area. Yet air pollution was just one of many urban problems that people sought to address. So in contrast to visions of a, a smart city that might involve sensing citizens, um, here people were engaged in numerous struggles for environmental justice and also to address economic and other forms of inequality. And sensors and data practices then sort of entered into this mix of different struggles for rights and citizenships rather than being a standalone project. So as the, the dust boxes were assembling in this context into provisionally workable sensors, we built also on methods from our fracking-based research to organize a public workshop and walk in late October, 2016. And we brought together community groups, residents, health researchers, an assembly member of the Greater London Authority. And we discussed air quality in these changing environments of Southeast London where quite a number of new construction proposals were underway, which you can get a sense of on this map um, in the sort of light orange areas. These were new construction developments um, that were approved and um, were taking hold and some of the other areas were already under construction. So we mapped out areas people thought would be most ideal for monitoring, considered existing uh, data that might be in the area and other observations that we could collect about sound, smell, construction activity, traffic, and other urban events that we would bring together through uh, another iteration of a logbook here, the Dustbox logbook, um, and uh, use this to eventually inform another iteration of data stories. So the Dustbox infrastructure grew into a changeable and fluctuating infrastructure. As new people began monitoring, others paused or stopped, we set up a citizen sensing network that included up to 30 dust box sensors monitoring particulate matter 2.5, but this number varied throughout the um, 10 month monitoring period. So we had about 18 sites with continuous data and others with more sporadic data. And throughout the process, we made numerous visits to monitoring sites to install and repair devices, connect them to Wi-Fi networks, find suitable outdoor space for monitoring urban air and make further adjustments along the way. And inevitably the question arose as to what could be done with the data from the sensor devices, um, which was a kind of continuing uh, question that people had throughout the entirety of our citizen sense work, especially given how much effort is required to set up the monitors. Of course, you've got the sensors in place. You want to know what you can do with the citizen data how it might generate forms of evidence that can support and mobilize rights to breathable worlds. And citizen data often does not merely replicate or even simply challenge official data sets. Instead, it is often figuring different worlds and calling them into being by expressing lived experiences, recasting approaches to air pollution and proposing different configurations of urban environments. So people are monitoring in locations and ways that are much different than regulatory monitoring. And this is something I unpack uh, further in the discussion of this particular case study, uh, if you're interested in this. Um, but for instance, regulatory monitoring might try to understand annual um, levels of pollution, but at a kind of 24 hour or even hourly uh, way of looking at pollution uh, patterns, you can understand urban activity um, in much more granular detail. 
So based on our earlier fracking research, we further developed our AirSift platform, which you can see here, where we were mapping and monitoring locations using fuzzy uh, locations. So this was, we used broad blue circles to sort of give a general sense of where monitoring was located without uh, pinpointing it. We also had anonymous monitoring locations that weren't necessarily mapped for various reasons people wanted to, um, and institutions wanted to remain anonymous. We brought in data from other monitoring locations, including the London Air Quality Network using their API to compare the citizen sensing data with the regulatory data. So you could get a sense of a relative sort of parity in the readings where that was relevant. And people could then use this toolkit to analyze their data and to understand um, sort of site specific patterns that they might be seeing. So with these analysis techniques, we discussed how this data also assembled into different forms of evidence that could be used for informing policy, neighborhood plans, or other initiatives that were responding to live development in construction sites, as well as transport issues and other concerns in this rapidly changing part of London. So based on multiple meetings, data workshops, and conversations with participants and residents, we collected the findings from the 10 months of dustbox monitoring into seven online and print format dustbox uh, depth for data stories. We crafted the data stories as a collaborative method for figuring citizen sensor data in the form of numerical measurements, maps, on the ground observations, images and narratives about activity in the urban environment. And these assembled into distinct accounts of air pollution that were um, narrating what might be usually overlooked in urban experiences, while also making collective proposals for how to transform environments toward greater livability. So uh, highlights from the citizen data we found were that major traffic intersections and construction activity, as well as the River Thames all showed up as likely pollution sources. We also found that green spaces and sheltered gardens often had much lower levels of particulate matter. So with these findings, we um, had uh, initial conversations with people before we launched the data stories to think about how this might inform proposals people wanted to make um, to connect their, to their existing initiatives and to inform conversations they might want to have with local government. So these, these data stories and the, the findings that we were finding from the, the citizen data were very much folding into community projects. These were ways of thinking about transforming the urban realm as an expression of the right to breathable worlds, to, to breathable worlds. So data ac accumulated here um, as a way to work across citizens' rights, technologies, and material urban conditions. So this is a way of saying this wasn't simply about raising awareness about high pollution in urban environments, but rather this very much connected to initiatives that people already had underway. So people were working to um, develop transportation pilot experiment, experiments. People were trying to argue for the protection of urban green space. So this became a way of really in a, in a live and um, sort of uh, engaged way to reshape or protect urban uh, spaces through the gathering of citizen evidence. And people were really, really sort of um, firm in wanting to not simply say pollution is high because they felt that message was um, very much sort of uh, reiterated uh, again and again, but didn't necessarily lead to uh, changes in uh, how pollution was addressed. So what that then meant is we had a, a workshop with uh, community members to co-author action points. And you can find these in the data stories for each of the data stories. Um, some of these sort of carry over across the seven data stories and some are specific to the, the sites. But we proposed a set of uh, actions that are sort of wish list for how to improve conditions in the urban realm and to work towards uh, social and environmental justice. So you could say that citizen sensing is joining up with a form of citizen design where democratized environmental evidence is generating proposals to shape urban environments. So we then, after having a kind of preliminary um, set of workshops, looking at the data stories, 
uh, with community groups. We then published these and released these into the um, public realm in November of 2017. We circulated a press release to local councillors, policymakers, the press, and so on. I suppose inevitably the media took up the story about how some of the pollution findings were that uh, levels were six times higher than the World Health Organization limit in some areas. But uh, community groups really wanted to stress that they had concrete proposals for how to address this. Uh, a local MP, um, Vicki Foxcroft, took up the press and, and media um, news about this, these findings and asked for a debate in parliament. And uh, here Andrea Leedsom responded to say that the government was tackling the problem of air pollution, but of course this was in quite, uh, quite general terms. So citizens were quite, um, you could say, I suppose, impressed that their, their data was circulating to the center of UK government. But then in some ways, uh, it was met with relative platitudes when it did get to parliament for debate. But nevertheless, they felt this attention to their monitoring did give them further um, sort of energy to think about how their data could generate and uh, contribute to their existing initiatives. And in some cases, they were successful in obtaining uh, money to support bids uh, for sustainable transport experiments. In other cases, they were less successful in protecting green space. So this wasn't a straightforward uh, trajectory from data to action. It was a process of struggle of trying to work with citizen data to uh, realize more breathable worlds. And in some cases, as you can see here, the green space um, was raised. So behind the hoardings, uh, this used to be a sort of tree filled space, um, a kind of somewhat wild community green space with high biodiversity um, where uh, trees were cut down for the um, for a housing development. And then on the other side of this, there's the super sewer development where further trees were raised for the super sewer development. So it was quite an extensive raising of green space um, in this area, despite uh, other areas being successful in uh, obtaining funding for transport experiments. So here, citizen data practices did not merely demonstrate that air pollution was occurring or that it exceeded regulatory guidelines. Instead, it folded into campaigns and projects for transforming the urban realm to varying levels of success. And this was exactly part of these struggles to not only address urban pollution and inequality, but also to attempt to work toward more breathable worlds. So then to turn to the final uh, case study, which is uh, multiple citizens, how to cultivate relations. Here we were uh, working in a much different context in the financial center of London, uh, which is often called the city of London, which can be somewhat confusing, um, but this is the square mile rather than the greater London uh, area. Um, but here we were looking at how environmental sensors are of course well established as technologies that are analog or digital, but environmental sensing might also be understood through technologies that are through other sorts of um, configurations that are not technologies. And here, thinking about organisms as sensors um, with, with plants, lichens, mosses, and many other um, entities forming as uh, air quality sensors, we could even say, you see through this uh, chart here of lichens um, as indicators of air pollution. Of course, birds, marine life, and many other organisms are detecting, responding, and um, signaling changes in their milieus. And such exchanges across organisms and environments demonstrate how sensing involves multiple entities and worlds of experience. So we could think about more than human modes of sensing as something that digital sensors can also tune into or work alongside with. So in this way, plants perform as sensors and measurement devices that detect environmental changes, of course, in different ways than digital sensors. Some plants signal the presence of particular pollutants in environments through their leaves and growth patterns. Other plants are especially effective at taking up pollutants by absorbing uh, gaseous substances through their stomata, drawing in heavy metals from the soil, from their roots, 
or channeling and depositing particles on their leaves. And although vegetal participants are involved in sensing, absorbing, capturing, recycling, and reworking pollutants, they often don't feature within the wider context of citizen sensing as citizen sensors of sorts. So in this third case study, we um, are working to construct two air quality gardens as sites of vegetal and digital pollution sensing. And these gardens were uh, developed with several collaborators, including the Museum of London in the uh, square mile, a landscape architect from Grow Elephant, and the air quality team at the City of London Corporation, which is the, the local council for the City of London, to develop and test air pollution gardens that were co-located with the dust box air pollution monitors. And so we were brought in to um, contribute to this air, this uh, development of air quality gardens, and also to um, activate some of the programming for the space in the form of a workshop and walk, which we did through the development and refinement of a phytosensor toolkit, which you can see here, that provided how-to instructions for people to develop air quality gardens. So we had a sort of first iteration of the phytosensor toolkit, which we tested and developed with um, community groups that were really coming from all over, um, all over London and farther afield. So here in this case study, I'll describe the planning, design, construction, and toolkitting of air pollution gardens that we developed to consider how plants become evident as sensing organisms along with digital air pollution sensors, and how plants are capturing and mitigating air pollution and uh, generating other modes of relational sensing that recast environmental experience. So air quality gardens sense and transform polluted urban air through vegetation that traps and absorbs pollutants. Citizen sensing practices mater can materialize here as a composite composition of air pollution plants and digital sensors, along with residents, workers, cultural institutions, and local government agencies. So we can think about the citizen here less as a universal or individual human agent, and more as a project of activating socio-political relations across pluralistic registers, adding to the pro proliferating list of citizens discussed um, today, including atmospheric citizens, speculative citizens, data citizens. Here, I suggest there are multiple citizens that are forming with and through other entities and worlds in the making. Citizens, in other words, form and exist in multiples as entities involved with many other entities. So while we were in the process of finalizing our collaborative monitoring in Southeast London in Deptford, in June 2017, the Museum of London wrote to Citizen Sense to ask if we would like to contribute to this project to develop air quality gardens and test the dust box sensors at the museum. And working with the city of London uh, with funding from a low emission neighborhood scheme from the mayor of London, we helped develop the gardens as part of a broader initiative that looked at projects um, across councils that could be developed for improving air quality. So London-wide initiatives included transport experiments, no idling campaigns, and green infrastructure installations. And as a, a sort of footnote here, there's considerable debate about green infrastructure within air quality research. Some air quality researchers see a focus on vegetation as distracting from the key problem of removing emissions at source. In contrast, others suggest that a wide range of approaches should be explored to improve air quality. Here, the question of practicability also arises. Citizens might be less well-placed to redesign transport infrastructure, for instance, than to plant air quality gardens. So the difficulty of shifting to less fossil fuel intensive transportation can prove intractable across all levels of governance. Citizens take up projects such as air quality gardens because other efforts to address air pollution have failed or because they feel this is an intervention with, that is within reach. So with the air quality garden installation, the Museum of London was interested in developing a demonstrator project to facilitate collective research into air quality. Citizen Sense contributed to the project by su providing suggestions for air quality plants that would bioindicate and mitigate air pollution, installing dust box sensors in gardens in nearby locations, hosting a workshop and walk with museum goers to investigate air, to investigate air quality vegetation and gardens, 
and develop this phytosensor toolkit for the wider development of air quality gardens. So that this um, is available online and, and provides a kind of how-to guide for how to develop these um, gardens. So in addition to our contribution, Grow Elephant, a London-based landscape architecture firm that had previously developed temporary community gardens and garden clubs, built two garden planter structures and installed the air quality plants and um, was responsible for the maintenance. So after a quite rapid development process, in September 2017, the Air Quality Demonstrator Garden opened at the museum as part of its City Now, City Future exhibition, with a garden at the entrance to the museum and another situated at a walkway intersection. But it's important to note that this project did not materialize a, a singular endeavor because community groups were also undertaking their own planting initiatives across the city of London. And you can see an example here. In some cases, they were quite um, developed air quality gardens that residents at Barbican, at the Barbican and Golden Lane Estates um, undertook with a sort of a newly uh, developed landscape architecture firm um, example XMPL uh, from the University of Greenwich. So you can see this example here where they worked with um, construction uh, uh, development sites to use some of the um, residue materials to plant air quality plants um, in these pop-up gardens. Community groups also developed their own pamphlets and self-published books about air quality plants and undertook their own diffusion monitoring uh, in the area as well. And this is a sort of popular mode of monitoring across London because it's low cost analog um, and uh, it's easy for people to put these monitors onto lampposts and understand air pollution vis-a-vis uh, -vis nitrogen, nitrogen dioxide uh, in the city. So this was the broader context of uh, community groups and uh, air quality gardens that were underway. And the demonstrator gardens, which you can see we're um, investigating here, were involved in and uh, sort of contributing to and learning from these wider local initiatives. So as part of the development of the phytosensor toolkit, we undertook a walk to look at the gardens and to um, investigate also the community gardens throughout the Barbican and City of London area, uh, and to look at the air pollution plants um, that were uh, planted in the area. And phytosensor is a term that we use to describe how vegetal entities are processing and responding to environmental pollution. And because sensing is taking place through these multiple other entities, we wanted to especially look on the walk at different ways that plants were responding to their environments, whether through absorbing and channeling pollutants or through um, changes in their physiology and appearance. So here you can see uh, the phytosensor toolkit and uh, in its sort of final form and the, the different components, which includes a description of the initiatives um, of the low emission neighborhood urban garden, air quality plants that people could consider. These, these were somewhat broadly um, sourced, but really quite specific to um, this area in uh, Western Europe, and um, also instructions for how to um, undertake various planting scenarios and examples of other air quality gardens, which you can see um, some of the scenarios here for how to build an air quality um, garden. So the material registers of pollution became more or less evident through the garden toolkit event and different engagements with vegetal sensors. We selected plants for the gardens that included species um, that could bioindicate, and in some cases this might mean the plants would be damaged, whether it's through ozone or, or other um, pollution events that might be uh, occurring. In other cases, plants, um, because they might have um, hirsute or hairy uh, or broad leaves, could act as surfaces to capture particles, which would then wash into soil uh, during rainstorms. At the same time, plants can be sources of uh, pollution if they emit biogenic volatile organic compounds, as U does, which can combine with other pollutants such as nitrogen oxide to form ozone. So for this reason, simply planting more vegetation because it is green does not necessarily improve air quality, but it could exacerbate pollution depending on the particular mix of pollutants in any given um, environment. 
So plants are bioremediating, they're sensing, they're phytoremediating. And this is part of what the, the air quality gardens and the phytosensor toolkit sought to investigate and also to um, document and um, explore as a trajectory for further action. And of course, we set up the dust boxes to monitor real-time pollution in these sites and to consider how we could think about plant sensing alongside digital sensing. And as part of this, we also worked with the City of London a Corporation to place the dust boxes within the regulatory monitor. So we'd have another data source um, where we'd be able to compare data across regulatory monitors, dust box monitors, and the, um, I suppose, more unconventional way of understanding data through plant sensing. And you can see this installation here. And, and this is in a particularly polluted tunnel, um, the beat where this Beach Street monitor, where there's particularly high levels of pollution. And you can see some of the grime that can collects on the um, monitor here. So the dust box is provided a way to compare pollution levels throughout the area while looking at these relationships across sensors. And here, vegetal sensors became a way to tune into different approaches to cultivating less toxic atmospheric exchanges, where we could think about uh, pollution patterns, but also follow these trajectories for how to develop air quality gardens and think more broadly about how to redesign the urban realm. So it's fair to say here that citizen sensing and citizen gardening began to merge in the search for more breathable urban conditions. In this polluted location adjacent to the entrance of the B Street Tunnel, which you can see this planting here is right next to that monitor, the dust box, the monitor, and these community gardens shared the space within the brutalist architectural style of the Barbican and uh, created kind of provocations for how to remake the city and these highly polluted uh, roadways. And in fact, there have now been transportation experiments to consider how to close down or pedestrianize the um, Beat Street Tunnel or to otherwise mitigate the high levels of pollution here. So air quality gardens alone do not solve the problem of air pollution, but these are engagements that allow us to think about sensing across more than human, digital, and other registers for how to create citizen actions within might, what might be more intractable political processes and to transform unbreathable urban conditions. And this becomes a way to make and remake environments while attending to other entities and cultivating other contributions for expanding breathable worlds. So the Phytosensor Toolkit is available on the Museum of London website, as well as the Citizen Sense website um, as a kind of how-to guide for thinking about how to cultivate other relations that can de depart from these established, more polluting inhabitations. So to conclude then in thinking about how to build breathable worlds, the three case studies that I've discussed today describe how citizen sense researchers, communities, and many other collaborators have found ways to cooperate and undertake collective inquiry using sensors. We research the multiple ways people monitor and observe environmental problems, including how to collect and analyze data on air pollution and emission sources, how to mobilize observations, how to lobby industry and governments to take action, and how to engage in collaborations and protests as different worlds in the making collide with inequalities and power imbalances. And we've also then developed further infrastructures from this, including the air kit and air sift um, infrastructure, which builds on many of these um, experiments to, to try to create a platform for community groups to work more independently if they wish so to do so. So environmental sensing toolkits could activate particular technological expressions of citizenship. But Citizens of World seeks to redirect the focus on citizenship less toward the agency of a singular human subject or the more neutral registers of digital participation. Instead, it orients more toward the distributions of effect and effectiveness formed in collective struggles for breathable worlds. These citizens and worlds come into being, proliferate, subside, and are erased. The commitment to build worlds through cooperative work and resonant experiences 
is the generative spark that binds them together. Sense-making then becomes critical to the doing and sustaining of democratic worlds. So if you're interested in uh, this material, of course, this is really just skating over the surface of um, almost 10 years worth of, of research. Um, you can find Citizens of Worlds on Manifold now. The final version will be out later this year, and it will be updated on Manifold when uh, that's out. If you're interested in the how-to exploration, there is a Forerunners uh, kit also with the, um, and text also with University of Minnesota Press, which is on Manifold and available as a book. Um, this is eventually a chapter in Citizens of Worlds. And I've developed a broader theoretical exploration of sensors in Program Earth. I also just want to note that the videos you saw um, were developed in collaboration with Catherine Pancake, and those are available on Vimeo. You can find our Dustbox logbook, Phytosensor logbook, and the AirSift um, at those URLs, as well as the data stories. And um, the credits are so extensive, it would probably take me another hour just to read through them. So um, this is really just uh, to show you how extensive uh, uh, the various groups were involved in the different case studies. And you can find these names and many more in the Citizens of Worlds book and on the Citizen Sense website. And of course, I'd like to thank the ERC for funding, University of Cambridge, where I'm based now, and also Goldsmiths University of London, where this work was undertaken. So that is uh, everything I have for you tonight. And thanks for listening. Yeah, for, thank you so much. It's been an absolutely fascinating uh, under, uh, learning about what you've been doing and how you, how you do it. Absolutely fascinating for me to see the sort of combination of participation, citizen science, um, but also thinking of, uh, thinking quite out of the box of how you do things and uh, subtly but um, from the ground up uh, potentially reshape our world, which has been just extraordinary to watch. And I'm sure the students are going to have an absolutely fascinating time with you tomorrow. And you're very generous in the time that you will give them. And I thank you in advance for that. So thank you. I look forward to that tomorrow. That would be great. That would be great. So thank you all for joining us this evening. As I mentioned earlier, Jennifer's exhibition is currently on show in the Brian Lewis Atrium and Level 1 at the Glenn Davis Building, so please do come along and see it if you can. I'll just also uh, point out a couple of uh, events that are coming up, and I know that there will be screens that will activate in just a second. On the 27th of April, between 9am and 12.30pm, uh, Akahatch um, symposium Australasia and the Global Turn in Architectural History will be held in the Japanese room and concurrently online. And on the 17th of May between 9am and 10.30am, uh, the Dean's Lecture Series Ensemble Studio Research Zoom webinar will be held. Thank you again, and I wish you all a very good evening. <laughs>